on the morning of August 1, 1966, shots ring out from the observation deck of the clock tower on the University of Texas campus. It marks the infamous beginning of the modern era of mass shootings in America. I'm Sarah Ferris, true crime podcaster. And I'm Catherine Schweit, the former head of the FBI's active shooter program. And you're listening to Stop the Killing. Hello, podcast listeners. Catherine Schweit here with Sarah Ferris on the line. And we have a wonderful guest today. We're going to have a, the best conversation about a topic that I get asked about all the time. And actually, maybe I'll have him uh, introduce himself. It's our guest, Stefan. Just give us the 411. Yeah, I'm Stefan Baez. I spent 20, well, about 23 years in law enforcement. I retired about two years ago uh, during my career in law enforcement. I did a little bit of everything. Patrol, I spent 10 years in our gain unit. Spent some time in our schools as a school resource officer and then retired as a patrol sergeant. I'm now retired and I'm actually the assistant director of campus safety at a four-year college. So kind of taking my years in the schools and my expertise and kind of carrying them to a higher education setting. Most of the time for about 10 years, I ran our active shooter program in my police department. So we did all of our training for our officers, uh, but we also worked with all of our schools, um, developing their emergency operation plans, their drills. Um, how they would handle emergency situation, running through tabletop exercises. Um, we did every school in our town. So we're talking, it was about 15 schools that we worked with over the time. But really my, part of my background is too, is that I have two sons with autism. And as I learned more about their disability, I began to wonder how things would happen interacting with law enforcement, but also how they would do things within a school system if we had an emergency, an active shooter, a bomb threat, a fire alarm. And what's going to be done to work with my son's disability to make sure they're safe in their school environment. And when you look more into it, you realize that there was very little in place on how they were doing these drills. And that's really what got me started in kind of doing all this is that it has that personal touch. And I was wondering how my sons would get through an emergency drill or an emergency situation in their school if something did happen. I just wanted to jump in to say that this area, the idea of how we talk and train to everyone and make sure that we consider people with you know physical disabilities emotional disabilities mental disabilities that this is an area that it touches everything it's not just schools it's not just businesses this is such valuable information so i love that you're coming in today to give us this conversation even think about somebody who is older and you know has bad knees or younger and has bad knees you know, and they can't move Please. fast. How do they make decisions? You know, so even though your law enforcement in your career, really what we brought you on today to talk about was responding and working and dealing with people who have disabilities, something I get asked all the time. I get that call all the time. Like, how do we work with our kids with an IEP uh, or individual education plan within our schools? And how do we do these drills? Um, and I get a lot of requests and a lot of feedback from schools um, that really just don't have an idea. And they're like, well, we'll just kind of, you know, we'll just kind of intermingle them with a the general education population and hopefully they'll figure it out. And we know that's not the mm -hmm. case. Specifically, we're talking about sensory needs, which is a huge Yeah, part. talk about that specifically, because I think that's the first thing, right? Sensory needs. You know, we work with some people, even the company that's sponsoring us right now, EZPA, part of one of the things they are concerned about is light sensors and sound sensors that, you know, motion sensors, things that can impact. So how do you accommodate for that? Because we know that, you know, that's something that companies have to worry about when they're providing a service to a school. Yeah. When you're considering those sensory needs, right? The first thing that comes to your mind is a fire alarm. So I will come from my own my, my experience, my youngest son, there is nothing worse in this world than that fire alarm going up in school. It is for him, it is the end all be all worst thing in the world. And we've seen mm -hmm. uh, problem behaviors. We've seen aggressive behaviors. We've seen elopement behaviors because of the fire alarm. So what we did and we were working with our school district, especially in the fire alarm side is it's the noise. It's overwhelming with him. And what if the simple thing this school did is they just said, can you give us a heads up when the drills are coming? That was a simple thing. And the schools were like, absolutely. So we knew the drill was coming. He wears noise canceling headphones to kind of block out that sensory. And so he was prepared for that with his noise canceling headphones and kind of working through it a little bit. He was able to accommodate the drill. He knows exactly what to do. 
But when he took away the sensory needs, it doesn't become overwhelming. And he focused on exactly what he needed to do. And this is, it sounds crazy, but it's a simple thing of making accommodation for that individual. So uh, you mentioned a couple of words in the challenges. You've flipped through them very quickly, used the word elopement as part of it. Just for our listening audience, that is a term I know from the medical community. Yeah. Uh, so with autism, elopement or wandering is a very common behavior. And about 50% of our autism population will wander from a safe environment. So homes, schools, places like that. Um, and there's really a couple different reasons why elopement occurs. First is goal-oriented. There's usually some kind of goal. They want something, they need something. Uh, but the next one is escape. We're trying to get out of an uncomfortable situation. And in my son's case, his wandering or elopement or bolting from the school was an escape behavior from the sensory overload that he was experiencing during the fire alarm. So we had to put these accommodations in place for the school because we know he had bolted from the school on multiple occasions during a fire alarm, during a fire drill. And the risk when somebody takes off from a school, an elopement, is what? I mean, that's not bad behavior. They're protecting themselves, but what's the risk to them? Well, the risk is, in, especially, in, and I'll use my son as an example, is he has no concept of fear that's or a concept of danger. So if he takes off, it is just, this is overwhelming. I'm getting out of here. I'll run into the street. I'll run to an, uh, a stranger's yard. And I'll keep running, even though I really don't have any idea where I am or how to get back. And this is very common what we see. And then, especially with our, especially in the autism population, there's a strong attraction to water. And the numbers vary a little bit, but it's about 84% of the fatalities involving children with autism in water events is from drowning. So I train law enforcement. Oh. I tell them if you have the resources, you go to your bodies of water first and you leave somebody there because at some point they will end up there. Um, traffic. Um, are all things that are dangerous because, again, part of the disability is they don't understand the concept of fear or understand consequences, cause and effect. It really doesn't function the same way in autism that it does with somebody who's neurotypical. And so there's a mm -hmm. huge concern. So when they low, they'll just keep running until they're as far away as they can. But now I may not know how to go get back to my school. I may run into traffic into a busy lane highway. I may go seek help from a stranger or be approached by a stranger. So there's so many different dangers with it, which is one of those things we had to accommodate for my son is somebody had to be with him during the entire drill. But we learned the hard way when he took off that they were prepared and he did take off and they got out of the building. And that, we and that was a fire drill, right? That was a fire so that's drill. That's what you said, a fire drill. And a drill is a drill is a drill in, in many ways. So can you extrapolate? We obviously are talking about targeted violence on our podcast a lot, but danger is danger. And I always say active shooter training is safety training. That's what yes. it is. And if you think of it as safety training, which is how we think of it in law enforcement and how the school administration should think of it, it's just one more type of safety training, then it doesn't become so overwhelming. And what you might use for a fire alarm and you might use for a tornado, it's all safety training. Stay in the building, stay out of the building. Here's the risk. Here's the danger and engage the danger accordingly. Just like in a tornado situation, it, it is a momentary uh, thing that passes by, but you have to be someplace safe in that moment. And uh, that's kind of where we are with shootings. So how do you accommodate teachers and school administrators who are saying, hey, we need to think about having these active shooter drills, and that's going to be harder for our population, especially our population that, that's neuroatypical. Is that the right term? No. Neurodiverse. Yeah. Neurodiverse. Thank you. That's better. Neurodiverse. And it really starts with understanding the needs of your students. And when I say this has to be individual, it really does have to be individual because, you know, there's a saying out there with autism. If you know one person with autism, you know one person with autism because the person next <laughs> to them displays different characteristics, right? So it really comes down to an individual basis. And I think what we're seeing now, especially here in my home state of Illinois, is a law was just passed January 1, where now they can have accommodations for safety drills placed into their IEP or their individual education plan, which is wonderful. I don't know if there are any other states to do it, but for Illinois to jump on board and do that was great. And what I mean by meeting individual needs, if we know that sounds can be overwhelming, well, what resources or what things can we do to reduce that? I mean, a great tool is noise canceling headphones. What I tell schools to do is have, in essence, a sensory kit for each of your students, um, different mm -hmm. fidgets, 
most kids think headphones, different things that are individual to that student. So when you have this drill, these are items that will help reduce some of the anxiety, fear, what? or kind of reduce some of that sensory input that they're seeking. But wow, really, what are some of the things that would be in that kit? That's fascinating. So one of the things we did with our sensory kits, we had them in our squad cars in my police department that I retired from for this exact reason, but we had noise canceling headphones, different fidgets to meet sensory needs. We had a dry erase board and a dry erase marker for nonverbal communication. We had a set of picture cards. They're called PEX cards, picture exchange card system. And it helps visually understand and communicate because we know that about 40% of the population with autism is either limited or nonverbal. So how do you do the communication if you can't communicate in a typical way that we do? The use of visuals is a great resource, but you can cater these kids towards the individual needs of that student, uh, which is a great thing. Yeah. Um, we tell them to have staff members assigned to that individual student because we know in our self-contained special ed classrooms, typically it's not just one teacher. It's a teacher, a few aides, so there are other professional staff in the classroom to assist. And we know the ratio between staff and students is significantly lower. So you can assign one or two students to a staff member. And those staff members are now responsible. In an emergency, you're obtaining that sensory kit. Or we have your students be like, okay, we have a drill. Where's your sensory kit? And then they're taking that kit with them. And it gives them that sense of security because these items are comfortable to that student. And they know that they will meet their sensory needs. It'll help them process some of the information going on. So Kevin kind of brought it up about active shooter incidents, whether you're using Alice or Run, Hide, Fight or Alert or any of the other programs that are out there, the concept is really all the same, right? If you're in a safe environment, lock down, stay safe. But if you can have a clear escape route, escape, and then there's a last resort you're fighting. We know our kids with special needs are probably not going to be in that fight scenario. So you're really locking down or evacuating. So what I tell teachers and staff members, specifically SROs, is turn your drill into a game. So if we're going to lock down, we're going to be hide and seek. If we're escaping, it's going to be red light, green light, or follow the leader. Right. So yeah. if I'm leaving the room, you're going to follow the teacher. If I stop, you stop. Red light, green light. So you're creating it as a game and not taking some of that anxiety built off of that. I think I told teachers and staff, that's a great way to kind of do it as create it as a game, but you're preparing for this drill. Like schools get notified, we're going to do a drill on September 15th, right? Well, your preparation starts September 1st because you're going to give your students tidbits a little bit each time. We're going to talk about this today for 10 minutes. Then we're going to talk about this today for 10 minutes. So you're not doing it the day before your drill and saying, okay, we're going to have a drill tomorrow. We're going to prepare for this. It starts ahead of time. Does it take more time? Yes. But those students will be more prepared because you've walked through this. So using visuals, using sensory kits, identifying staff members to individually work with a handful of the students uh, will help them get through these drills. We're creating it as a game, right? We want to take the anxiety out of it. So let's make it a game. And you can do the same thing with our younger kids, our kindergarten, pre-K, first, second grade. You can turn it into a game as well. And take some of the anxiety and fear that goes along with a like an active shooter drill. So busy writing pump, notes in case place. you're wondering. Yeah, <laughs> so there's lots I'm like, to write down. Every bit, I'm like soaking every second of it in. I love the idea of turning it into a game, but my question might be to you is, do you do that for uh, the entire class? Do you think that's a good, sensible way, for instance, to teach fire drills and tornado drills for, you know, the whole kindergarten class? I mean, not even just the kids with special needs, turning it into yeah. a game. Absolutely, because yeah. we're doing age appropriate, right? We want it to match the level, right. of, you know, age appropriate and how you're doing it. Right. And we've seen all sorts of books and things out to kind of make it age appropriate. Well, turning it into a game makes it fun and puts it in an age appropriate setting for those kids to understand. So if I tell them we're going to do red light, green light, all well, these kids know red light, green light, or we're going to do hide and seek or follow the leader if you're going to create those games. So the kids are like, this isn't like a drill. This isn't something we have anxiety or worry about. We're going to play a game. Right? But do you think that the classroom teachers would say, well, the kids don't take it seriously when they think it's a game. They giggle and they laugh. I mean, now kids with, you know, special needs, you know, might, but what about the other kids? How do you mix it up? Well, I think it's having that conversation at the time. The teacher can say, we're going to prepare for these drills, but this is how we're going to do it. There's nothing to be fearful of this. And be specific. I mean, we have to let our students know what could potentially happen. But right. it's, you're putting it on a lighter side. Like, we're going to do all this, but guess what? 
what this really is, it is hide and seek. And here is the same thing. This is what we're practicing, but this is how we're going to make it more fun for the class to do it, right? And you're kind of reducing some of that anxiety that goes with it. Do you have the conversation with, you know, your kids who are maybe on an IEP into different conversations? Do you have separate conversations with them? You can based on their needs, right? We know students with IEPs, it could be a, a variety of different disabilities, right? So right. you have to individually have them. Like for my boys, they're in a self-contained classroom just for autism. But it's not just that discipline that's present. It's ADHD, it's anxiety, it's, you know, um, deaf or hard of hearing. So there's a lot of different things. So you really have to, and their classrooms are very small. So it's easier to have a one, an individual conversation with a one-on-one -on -one with eight students in a classroom as opposed to 45 students in a classroom or 27 yeah, classrooms. So, no. so what kind of advice would you give a teacher who's listening, who um, has, you know, 25 kids in her classroom and she's teaching third graders or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and she has, you know, one or two children that my lame language would be that they've mainstreamed in. So that would be my wife because she's a third grade teacher and she has about oh, there you go. 19 <laughs> students. So she's Very a third grade specific. teacher. Yeah. yeah. So I will tell you exactly how she does this is for kids that do have an IEP that are kind of mainstreamed into that general education classroom. She'll pull them or work with them individually based off of their needs. She starts preparing her class for her drills days prior to the drill ever occurring. We're not doing this the day of. Mm -hmm. We're doing this that day. And I say bring up the game is because I'm stealing her idea. This was her idea of how she did it. With oh, first. Like, true confessions come out now, Sarah. True confessions, <laughs> absolutely. But having it make it be making more, not lighthearted, but making kind of that anxiety build off of it. The use of visuals is another great way to be able to do that. So the other thing that I'm hearing is that school districts need to plan ahead for these drills for whatever type of drill it is. The, and they need to give plenty of notice to the teachers so that they devise their own systems in their classroom to accommodate the students that they have, knowing whatever ages they have and whatever students they have who might have been mainstreamed in. It's important that the teachers don't hear about the drill three days beforehand or the day it's off, exactly. it's which exactly. I think happens. Right. Oh, a hundred percent it happens. We'll, they'll, get a, they'll get a call on Wednesday that we're doing a drill Friday afternoon. So you're not giving your staff and your students time to prepare for that drill, especially for your students that have more needs. It may take them a little bit longer to process some of this information. So as much like many schools plan out their drills way in advance. When I was in the schools as an SRO, I would get a list of drill dates for my schools in September for the entire year. And I would pencil them into my calendar so that I could be there for their drills. And things so you're happen. in Illinois. And, and so you're dealing with fire drills, tornado drills, active shooter drills. Correct. All separate. Some are state mandated in different ways. Other states have different rules and regulations, but you're trying to get fit in all of these kinds of drills, right? Yes. And it was, I had, when I was in the schools, I had eight schools. So I was consistently running to a school for some drill. Some of that was me, like the fire drills I didn't always go to because the fire department would be there. A fire drill is something we practiced, everybody's practice, but our active shooter drills, I would always be there. And I'd walk through the building and I would talk about things where you can improve and things like that. Because I wanted our schools to get firsthand feedback of where we can improve. You know, we're talking to somebody who has such a fantastic experience in, in an area that we get asked questions about all the time. When it comes to the difference between a active shooter drill and a fire drill, for anybody who doesn't know the difference, how is it different for the teachers and the students in general, just in general, in your well, mind? With our, with our fire alarm, fire drills, the, you know, the standard procedure is you kind of, you line up, you exit the building, you have your predetermined response, your teachers take attendance to make sure everybody's there. With our active shooter drills, it's a little more fluid, right? We know we can either lock down, if we have to escape or run, we can get out. And then our last resort is a fight or counter or whatever, however, terminology. And that's the biggest thing. What we're talking about now with fire drills is we've seen in some of our active shooter incidents where that fire alarm has triggered. Right. Me, right. Yeah, that's you. So, read my next, you're reading my mind because that was my next question. And that's a challenge that we have. And sometimes a fire alarm isn't pulled at Parkland High School. Uh, in right. fact, the smoke from the weapon, they think, set the fire alarm off because the shooter happened to be 
underneath the fire alarm. But we see that a lot in the school's uh, situation. Sometimes the school gets emptied out. So then how do you adjust that or do you adjust or address that? Right. Yeah. What I tell teachers is usually you have advanced notice when a fire drill is coming or scheduled, right? So if it's an unscheduled drill, be like, okay, we didn't know this was coming today. We typically don't have surprise drills. But right? before you move your class out into the hallway, into an open setting, really taking your senses, right? What are you hearing in your hallway? What are you experiencing in your classroom? Do you see anything out of the ordinary? Do you hear anything out of the ordinary? Do you smell anything out of the ordinary? Use those senses to make you know, a decision. If everything looks good, then you move your class out. But before you're proceeding down a stairwell, a hallway, right? taking this consideration, we know that this is, is an option. And again, Parkland, you know, in our high school where I worked, on the third floor, if you had somebody shooting, on the first floor, you could not hear it. But Same thing alarm, in Parkland. Yeah, they had right, that problem. Right. The fire alarm could trigger. So first, second floor, maybe it's like, oh, it's a fire drill. We're, we're clearing out of the building, not knowing what's going on upstairs. So I That's tell- exactly what right? happened. So our students, I tell teachers, like, take a little bit of consideration when you hear a fire drill. Like fire safety now, and I'm not a fire safety expert, but schools are pretty safe. And fire prevention standards in schools is very good. You have that little bit of extra time. You would have gotten the building safely, but you had that little extra time to make a informed decision based off of using your senses and experiencing what's around you. And if it doesn't seem normal, like I tell everybody, trust your God. If this doesn't look normal, seem normal, something seems out of the ordinary, right? Use your gut and make the best informed decision you have with the information you have. And it's kind of really that dynamic of what we're seeing with our drills now. If we can go back to specifically those children that have got autism or sensory mm -hmm. overload when the alarms go off, you've got obviously a lot of preventative measures in place to make it a, a safer environment when you know there's a drill coming. But how do you prepare the teachers when that alarm goes off uh, and they haven't got the noise cancellation headphones on in preparation and then they've got somebody that, as you say, is dealing with something completely outside the experience of just the alarm. Yeah. And just like preparation for our students, it's preparation for our staff too. Right. Yeah. If you're preparing ahead of time before the drill, when it's an actual drill or something unexpected happens, we're like, okay, what's our routine? The teachers have to know their routines well. Okay. We're grabbing your sensory kids. Who do you need one? But the teacher has to kind of keep in the back of their mind, like, this is an unpanned drill. So is this an oops, which we have incidents where these alarms go off, it's accidental, it's working on electrical in the building, whatever it might be, or is this the real thing, right? But if we're prepared ahead of time, it takes a lot of anxiety off. When you have your students that become overwhelmed uh, by sensory needs, anxiety, things like that, the students' IEPs have coping strategies utilized by the teacher that help them de-escalate certain situations. So it may be the use of sensory-related items and those sensory kits. It may be Use of language. It used to be ignoring a problem behavior or different strategies that, that come with behavior intervention that will help work through that. This is where having your additional professional staff in that classroom can help assist with that because one teacher can't control eight kids that are now, in essence, in sensory overload, right? So if you have your assigned staff that works with these two students and the teacher has these two students, you've kind of divvied that up a little bit. And these are your assigned students. And then you have a backup. If I have, have a bit of teachers out, they're sick, whatever it is, you have a backup for that as well. But it, this is what I mean by preparation prior to these incidents is so critical because yeah. you have to have these things planned out ahead of time. And having that staff work with that student and understanding that student and their needs. So my son, my middle son, who was a freshman in high school, has a one-on-one -on -one aid. So that one-on-one -on -one aid knows exactly what his sensory needs, how to de-escalate him, so if they have a one-on-one -on -one aid, that's great because they have that individual person assigned to them. And this is where, again, those IEPs, those individual needs are preparing for ahead of time. But if you walk through it multiple times and practiced it a week or so or two weeks ahead of the drill, what it actually does happen, you kind of just go back into your routine. And is sensory a big part of it? Is it often when you talk about people who we need to be concerned about when it comes to drills? feel like I'm making this up. I am making this up, but I feel like a lot of parents might just say, I'm just going to opt out of that. You know, my kid yeah. is, it, whatever level they are, they're stressed. They'll be stressed out. I'm going to opt. I don't want them to go through 
drill after drill, fire drill, active shooter drill, you know, tornado drill. And it, I'm just going to opt out whenever the drills are coming. I'm just going to keep the kid home. Uh, tell me what the good answer to that is and the bad answer to that is. And yes, a lot of parents do opt out of it. And we were in a position too. We were like, we should want to opt out of this fire drill. But then there was the part of me that understands why it's so critical for to teach safety to our kids. Just because they have a disability doesn't mean they should be left out of that. So I shouldn't have to adjust for the drill. The drill needs to adjust for my kid to meet his needs. That's my philosophy. So I tell parents, I'm like, easy way out of it is to just say, you know, we're going to opt out. We'll keep them out that day. We'll opt out of the active shooter drill. But if you really do have something, how prepared is your kid or your child going to be in that school if they're not? So I tell them not. I'm like, it's why it's so critical. But, and again, I understand parents' dilemma. I was in that same dilemma with my own sons. But that's when I went to the schools and said, my kids don't have to adjust the drill. The drill has to adjust to them. So states are realizing this, like saying, no schools, you have to do this. You can't opt out of this. You have to make the accommodations for the drill to meet our students' needs. So, and I hope there's some other states that do follow suit. Illinois, obviously being that one, it is doing it. So they're not giving them that option now. Schools don't have a choice but to do it. But it shouldn't be a law that mandates the schools to do this. The schools should be meeting the needs of every student in their building, not just their general aid population, not just a handful of other students. They should be meeting the needs of all the students. And it doesn't take that much to make those accommodations for a drill for the schools. I tell parents, I'm like, you have to be the advocate for your loved one. You have to be your voice. And it's in everything, their academics, their behavior, discipline, safety, that you have to be a role in all of that. So... I tell parents, don't opt out. Please don't opt out. We did an episode uh, recently with a, a parent who uh, was completely invested in everything in their school safety, to be fair. But one of the things that really resonated with me was that she posed the question, after you do an active shooter training drill in their school, do you do an after action report? And they hadn't. So their school had the PTA. The Parents Association had said, listen, we will provide food. Can you please spend an hour doing an after-action report after you've done these active shooting drills? And the one key thing that she said really stood out was that they hadn't recognized this, but there was students that had, you know, all manner of different things that their parents had chosen for those children to opt out of the active shooter drills. So the Teachers themselves didn't know how to insert them into a real life situation if there was an emergency. And that created a whole new question of, okay, well, so now we need to recognize that, yes, we don't have that child in the school for this at drill, but we need a plan for it in the future. Is that stuff that you've come across or that you train them specifically? Yeah, I tell staff members, like, you know, if you're assigning a staff member to be work with that student, that's great, but always have a backup. Right, we know at some moment they may not be there. After action reports are a great way to see what you've done great, mm -hmm. you know, where you can improve. Uh, you know, tabletop exercises are another one that's a great way to be able to do that. And running a tabletop it really sees where your gaps in your policy procedures are, and that's where that after action comes in. Then almost every time when I did an act, a drill in my schools when I was a school resource officer, I would meet with the principal immediately after. I'm like, here's things we did great. Here's things we can improve on. And you'd say things like. We didn't even know that happened. And I'm like, as you walk through the building, but debriefing an incident after it occurs is critical because you really learn what you can do. I love it that these parent groups are being those advocates saying, this is great, but are you checking the box that you did your drill or you really want to learn and really want to improve? And I think that's a critical thing. A lot of our schools, I'll be honest, just say, we're checking the box. We did our drill. We did our mandated drill. We are mandated by state law. But other than that, we're not doing anything else. And that's wrong. And so I applaud those parent groups for being those advocates to say, no, let's get down. Let's go through this. And let's like, let's round table this and see what we did good. And that's what I always did with our students too. But I would always meet with our special needs classrooms and be like, how the drill go? Where can we improve and how do we make it better? So a lot of the things we've discovered, the input from special education teachers, special education para pros, special education parents. I think the point that Sarah made is kind of worth repeating is that when you take all your kids out, 
you opt out anybody who might have any particular different needs than the masses in the classroom, you're not giving your teachers a chance to train because the teachers then know there were three kids not in their classroom. But I think the thing about the drills is I can see as a parent always saying, we just won't do that. The chance that it's going to happen, we just won't do that. But to Sarah's point, you're pre- preventing the teacher from being able to protect your child. Yeah, Because exactly. they don't know how to do that. Yeah. Right. And I think a good point to bring up is like, we talk about our, our kids that are in the self-contained special education classroom, but I will tell you, there's a lot of students with special needs that have never been diagnosed and or have an IEP, but it's clear during right. their disability process, just from your experience, understanding it. So they sure. may not have that IEP or things like that. And I think in those situations, teachers understand those kids' needs and work with them. But going to your point, Sarah, what you said is if those parents are opting out of that, that teacher never has an opportunity to work with that student, see how they would react during the drill and make those necessary accommodations for that student. So you you really are doing an injustice to your school staff, your teachers, because they're not having the ability to see how that student would react during a drill and how to work through those situations or those needs that they have. And can I just add this? It's kind of like the nickel versus the quarter. If you know it's a drill, nothing is going to happen to your child, right? right. I mean, I get that, that your child might be traumatized, but you know that there's not an outside source coming in, whether it's a tornado or a fire or a shooter. So you know that the school can make the accommodations as best it can. And if you're raising a child, that child is going to turn into an adult. So then you want them to go on to college or go on to work someplace. They're going to be in the situations in the future. They're going to spend the hours outside of school in places where a fire drill might go off while they're at the movies or uh, at the restaurant. There might be something that happens at the restaurant. It's a learning process for the child as they grow to learn to deal with emergencies as part of their coping mechanisms in life. In school, the, the people are there to keep your child safe. Give them the chance to figure out how to keep your child safe. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll give you an example. I think using the strengths of the certain disabilities are a great way as well. So specifically for autism, they are driven by rules. Like my oldest son, they call him oh, the I sheriff. Love that. Because he calls out, my class was supposed to end at this time. You're not doing what you're supposed to do. Teachers, staff, principals, he doesn't care, right? That's just the way he is. What they call him the sheriff principal. <laughs> but using that strength, this ability is great. The rules say we're going to do this. The rule will say we're going to do this. Sometimes just adding that phrase will gain that compliance. Oh, the rule say they to do this. Strength of autism is they're very methodical in how they do things. They do things very routine. No matter what you throw at them, that routine is going to stay the same. So if you've practiced this drill, even if you have a real life emergency, the routine is, this is what I do. These are the rules. This is my methodical approach. That's how I do it. So you can use some of the strengths of certain disabilities as a great way to be able to have it and work through some of these things because it's just the strength of the disability. So um, can this be translated into things like, say in a classroom, you have a child who is in a wheelchair, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, the teacher, if they opt out, whatever this child's situation is, if they opt out because their child's in a wheelchair, I think it's logical that you don't give the school a chance to figure out how to get that child safely out of the building when there's a tornado or a fire. So you want to do that. But can you also use you know, rules and other students to help to do that. Okay, well, you sit right next to this person. So, you know, here's what you can do. This is something that you can do to help us to get out of the classroom. Maybe the rule is you try to push Mary Ellen's wheelchair, you know, out the door to the front of the classroom or something like that. Absolutely. It gives them something to do that's part of the solution and something that helps the teacher. Right. Absolutely. I'll tell you this. Kids love to have jobs, love to have tasks, love to have responsibility. So my wife with her third graders, everybody has a classroom job, whether it's watering plants, cleaning the chalkboard, whatever it is, they all have a job. They love it. So what you bring up your point is absolutely. If we have a drill, Joey, you're going to grab this. That's your task, right? And, And they feel awesome that they have this responsibility and they feel important. So kids love tasks. 
So I think it's a great way to incorporate your students into having tasks and things like that. But it also takes away from their anxiety built with the drill. That it is goes into true. it like, oh, okay, this is going on, but I have a job to do. I have to go get Joey's sensory bag or whatever it might be, whatever that task is. So yeah. signing tasks for kids, especially our younger kids, is a great way to kind of work through some of that because they become so focused on the job. Like my wife said, her kids will forget homework, school book, lunch money, whatever it is, but they won't forget to do their job in class. What's interesting about that, you know, I do another podcast called The Bravery Academy and on it, we've spoken to a lot of psychologists and part of recovery from any kind of trauma is feeling like you have control in the situation. And that's what you're speaking to there is if you've got a purpose in a situation that could be traumatic, your chances of recovery from any amount of that trauma is so much stronger as an outcome, which I think is a really important point. Like give people power in it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when these things happen, it's something that's completely out of your control, right? You can't control it. But if you have even a somewhat semblance of a little right. control, like I can control what I'm doing during this. Exactly. Yeah, I agree with you. It's a great point that you brought up. And I never looked at it from my perspective. When you say that, it makes, it really is. It really is a tremendous point. I never thought of it from that perspective, but it's a great point to bring up. What other kinds of challenges do people face during drills besides like a sensory challenge? So physical disabilities, and you mentioned the use of a wheelchair. Well, with students with a physical disability who would use a walker, a wheelchair, things like that, their philosophy is they have an area of refuge, meaning it's a, up in a stairwell and the student is left there. Everybody evacuates out of the building and leaves the student there. And it then becomes the first responder's responsibility to remove the student. If I am a parent and I have a, a loved one or a child with a physical disability and they are left on a second floor stairwell, I'm mad, right? We've I seen- just had that discussion yesterday with somebody. Exactly. Because that is the written directions in a lot of yes. things. Because in a high-rise building and you work in a big building, there is an area of refuge for fire drills. Yes. And th- that's where the fire department knows that they need to go for anybody who has limitations in, 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 in their inability to travel down seven flights of stairs or 20 flights of stairs. Firefighters have to get to this place. Right. And so... Talk about that specifically, that area of refuge, because I've heard people specifically bring that up as a bone of contention. And to me, it's a bone of contention because the goal of your drill is to evacuate the building, right? Depending on what it is. But yet you're leaving a suit in the building. Everybody else is leaving. To me, it just seems backwards to think that way. So a way we hope you overcome this is you have, again, staff members working with that student. How do you get them out? And it, it, there was an article that came out, it was about a year and a half ago, and it was actually from the Chicago Public Schools. And it was a high school student who uses a wheelchair, and they went through their drill and her area of refuge, and nobody come to, came to get her. They just left her there. Wow. That is shocking, isn't it? And terrifying so, as a parent. Like, and, and I understand the purpose of the area of refuge, right? But again, we're going back to the point, like, fire suppression and technology has made our buildings so much safer than they ever have been mm. in the past, right? And I understand the dynamics or wanting to get out of the building quickly, but I still don't understand the fact of leaving somebody in the building that you could, in essence, evacuate. And again, we go back to this point of utilizing staff members to how can you do this? If it is a mechanical or if an automated wheelchair, right? Do you have a manual wheelchair close to you that you can transition that student to so you're not bringing out a 500-pound wheelchair, but you have an ability to escape, evacuate them out of the building. But again, it's brainstorming. Like this is the student's needs. If we head to this building quickly, what do we need and how do we do it to be able to evacuate out of the building and not leave them in the building? The area refuge thing is is just, it's it's just a thing that just goes against all my logic. It really does. I just like poke the bear. I can tell. Totally did on this one. No. It makes sense though. Again, on the Bravery Academy, we had an amazing guest on called Dr. Kirk Adams, and he was the head of the Blind Foundation. Yeah. So he spoke to us about when he was addressing an auditorium full of people and talking about what disability actually is. And he said, if you're a five-foot person and you've got an eight-foot shelf, you have a disability in that Good. moment. And the point is that you need the tools, a step ladder, to make you abled in that situation. 
And that refuge spot, to me, says that those students are not being given the tools to be able to escape in that situation. Would that be fair? Yeah, absolutely it is. Because there are clearly ways to get them out of the building safely. We just right. haven't thought about it or yeah. don't have the right resources. Yeah, you're saying somebody could have a wheelchair that's, you know, is very heavy because of the equipment that's on it. But they got into that wheelchair. There are ways to get that person in and out of that wheelchair. And the school can do the same thing. Uh, just like, you know, at a public pool, they have a spot that will lift uh, yes. a person out of a wheelchair and put them into a pool. The idea that you can have a mobile wheelchair, you know, just the small ones, that's what firefighters use. Why isn't there one of those there and faculty members assigned to carry that child downstairs? We're talking right. about kids. You know, right. we're talking about under 100 pounds. I could right. carry a 100 pound person on my shoulders yeah. and not everybody could, but two people could carry a 100 pound person in a chair. And I know that I'm being very general, but it's the idea of thinking through, you know, when you have a third grader who's in a wheelchair, pick the kid up and carry him out. A strategy for success uh, to me would be uh, pick one problem and solve it in the next six months. Uh, and that might be leaving no one in an area of refuge. That might be getting the kits uh, that you were mentioning that they might not have or making sure that each child has their own kit. Other strategies for success for school districts who say this is a difficult problem, parents who say this is overwhelming, employees who say, employers who say, I only have, I don't even know if I have any uh, people who fit those categories. I think, you know, you look at it and you're like, this problem is so huge. And it's, I say the same way, how do you eat an elephant? Well, one bite at a time. And it's kind of what you're going at is that you're addressing one problem at a time. So all right, well, let's see what needs our students have and let's start with our kids. Let's get input from teachers, professional staff, and families. If we had these situations, what works for you as a family, what works for us at school, and let's come up with a plan for this student and let's have these resources available. Once you have that, and again, most of the time your special needs population is relatively smaller. So you can easily work through this and most teachers know that if they have an IEP or a 504 in place, all you're doing is now working with the family. You're meeting with the family every year anyway for that reevaluation or the annual IEP meeting. So getting the input, you have a guaranteed meeting with the family saying, you know, we're going to start addressing this safety drill. So we'd love to hear your input as a family. What do you think would work and how can we put some things in place? That's a great way to start. One uh, question right. to ask, right? One question right. to ask at the beginning in those initial meetings. We haven't addressed this before. We recognize that uh, we can always do better. We want to do everything we can to keep your children safe. It's as simple as that. And you, families will be like, no, we never thought about it. Let's brainstorm as a group. Let's brainstorm as a team. Um, how do we work? Or the parents are like, we know this will work. We know this won't. Work. You know, for us, with my son with the fire alarms, when he was younger, if we gave him a heads up, hey, in two days, we're going to have this fire drill, he was fine with it. But as he's gotten older, his anxiety has gotten worse. So giving him advance notice was worse, was worse because the anxiety built and built and built and it was coming. We said, forget it. So now he's did it as a surprise and he's much better with it. So these kids will change as they grow. So understanding that making those necessary changes as they grow, you know, from elementary school to junior high to high school and beyond, you're consistently adjusting these needs because those needs will change. So a great way to do that is interested in those IEP meetings, those annual meetings that they'll have with the families. So okay. starting there is a great spot. And that's a huge task right there that you've already made monumental steps forward by addressing those needs. Stephen, I feel like we've just scratched the tip of the iceberg. Where would you direct people for resources? A great way to start with your school. Like, what do you have in place and what are you doing? Is there resources that you can provide or that yeah. you can direct people to? So my website, it's www.bluelinespectrumsafety.com. I wrote an article on this very topic for Campus Safety Magazine. I've worked very closely with Campus Safety Magazine putting out these articles. So Adam Cochran and I did a joint article on this specific topic about addressing safety drills and our students with disabilities. So if you go to Campus Safety Magazine, that article is out there. And it's just six strategies to help developing a plan of how to 
uh, meet those needs of your students with disabilities. It's a great place to start. Campus Safety Magazine in general is a great place. There's a couple of different articles out there. Another great resource is go to your school resource officer. If you have an SRO assigned to the building, they're playing an instrumental role in your safety drills. So we're contacting that school resource officer and saying, have you thought about anything and what are your thoughts? If those SROs have not had any training regarding this, again, reach out to me. A big part of what I do now, in addition to training law enforcement, is I specifically work with school safety, school security, school resource officers, how to work within your students with disabilities within your buildings. Transition now into a higher education setting, same philosophy in a higher education setting. So for campus safety, campus police departments, university police departments, I'm now working with them as well at meeting those needs of your students with disabilities on your campus. Because the needs change as they grow older. And in a higher education setting, it's very different. Some of the behaviors and things we'll see are a little bit different. So I tell families and police officers across the country, I am a resource moving forward. If you have a question, you want to share something, you want to share a resource, uh, please reach out to me. I am always available. I want to hear feedback from uh, families, school resource officers, law enforcement across the country, of how they're doing things and where we can share that information and share it across the country to better improve those, the safety of our students with disabilities. It's a really, you know, obviously a passion of mine, and I want to be able to share that with as many families as I possibly can. And on my website is exactly what he was talking about, yeah. is on my website, on my resources page, I have responding to incidents involving persons with autism, Addison PD. Amazing. Well, I'll definitely put links to both of those. Your website's always in there, Catherine, in the show notes and to you, Stefan, as well, because I think there's going to be a lot of people just clicking that button, hopefully, through. And Did I not you tell you this was going to be the best episode, Sarah? Did like, I not? I've just learned so much. It's just, yeah, yeah totally fascinating. Thank you well, so I'm much. So I'm so glad, Stefan. Yeah, it's been a, a tremendous pleasure. And again, listening to the podcast, reading the book, and now kind of like sharing this with you. I said when I Sarah, when I come done, I'm like, I said, I have a face to go with the like voice now because I've listened to it on the podcast. So now I've got a face to go with it. You could have uh, just gone to the YouTube. You would have seen the face there. But <laughs> yeah, you're, the That's podcast right. is my two from commute to work where I yeah, get Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, I so love it. I'm an audiobook podcast guy. And so, you know, going through this, and obviously it's an area that's passionate of mine, whether it's school safety and whether it's my business, my professional role at, at, at my campus keep our students safe. And then obviously the professional, personal side of with my own subs with disabilities, like yeah. it is an area that I'm very passionate about. And I want to see um, all of our schools be successful. If we never have another incident where a student is hurt or injured in a school, then we have been successful. I don't know if you can really prevent all these incidents, but if you can keep our students safe by spreading this information knowledge, it's a win. It's a win. Thanks for listening. And if you want to know more, Catherine's book, Stop the Killing, is out now. For more details, go to katherineschweit.com. Please consider also supporting our independently made podcast. It's simple to do. Go to patreon.com forward slash stop the killing. And for as little as the price of a latte a month, you can be part of the solution to stop the killing. Patreon rewards range from official do-gooder status to ad-free episodes, autographed books, and opportunities to connect with us directly for your business, school, church, or even just a book club chat. But just knowing that you are part of a movement that has the power to make your community safer, well, that's got to taste better than a skinny cappuccino any day. So please head to patreon.com forward slash stop the killing now and polish off your do-gooder halo and make sure to include your name so we can give you a shout out. This podcast is a community podcast production. That's con with an N. If you want more content, then head over to Community Podcast at Instagram, where you'll find trailers on more binge-worthy true crime, like the award-winning podcast Conning the Con. And check out our show notes for all the links mentioned. Finally, if you want one takeaway action that you can do right now that can help make our community safer, Please share, rate and review this podcast wherever you listen. Everybody needs to know that they hold the keys to see something and say something. Together, we can stop the killing. It's one of those things you hope never happens, but you better train for it. Because it will happen. And it will happen in places you wouldn't expect. Be ready for it. <laughs>